This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is legendary college football Hall of Fame coach Gene Stallings. <laughs> The unofficial start of the college football season took place this week with the annual SEC Media Days in Hoover, Alabama. The three-day event concluded this afternoon and, as always, featured a record number of media members converging on the Winfrey Hotel, looking to find that one great quote, soundbite, or interview for their respective media organization. Last year, Texas A&M and Missouri joined the conference, giving the media 14 teams to chop at. SEC Media Days wasn't always this crazy, but the power of the conference has been. The great Gene Stallings is a former coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide and helped lead them to a perfect season in 1992 and a national championship. He has also coached at his alma mater, Texas A&M, who back then were part of the Southwest Conference. Stallings is one of the great coaches in college football history and a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. He was also a head coach in the National Football League. Today on Sports Files, Gene Stallings on the power of the SEC with their seven straight national championships. His time as a player under coach Paul Bear Bryant and his legacy as a football coach. Coach, thank you so much for being with us today. My privilege. We Always a joy. It. You speak at a lot of different functions, a lot of different places around the country. What's your main message? Well, when you're cheap, you go a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it depends on what it is. Uh, you know, I'm doing three different things this week. And uh, well, when I'm speaking in Memphis about it, it was the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I'm speaking at Prayer Breakfast in, in Dallas. And then I'm doing something for Chevrolet in, in Birmingham. So, you know, everything's a little bit different. We were looking at an article in USA Today about your daughters, who are all teachers, and what they're going to try to do with your help and the help of others to, to build a hospital in Haiti, where it's just been obviously a, a tough situation for the Haitians. Well, one for of all my these daughters years. have been there over 30 times. Her husband's a doctor. They live in Nashville. They have a foundation that basically says live beyond. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they purchased. Uh, 65 acres of land. On that 65 acres of land in this town of Thomaso, which has no electricity, no sewage, no fresh water, no wood, no anything. Wow. Uh, they're building a guest house where workers can stay. They're building a hospital, an orphanage, a home for the little handicapped child mm -hmm. called Johnny's House, right. and a worship center. So it's, it's going to change that little part of the world. We know how dear to your heart uh, that cause is, but how happy and, and satisfied are you being able to reach out and help people? Oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, you know, I've been blessed. Uh, you know, I've got good health. I've had good jobs. I've done what I, a lot of people don't have that. Right. They don't have a good job. They don't have good health. They don't have good families. And, and uh, so if we're not a little sympathetic toward the people that are a little less fortunate mm -hmm. than we are, uh, we just may not make it. Let's talk <clears throat> some pigskin now. All Texas A&M, right. your alma mater. Alabama won a national championship as a head coach there, also a head coach with the Aggies. Lo and behold, they're both in the same conference now. As Texas yeah. A&M has joined the SEC, and you had a little something to do with that. I served on the Board of Regents. Uh, when uh, uh, in Texas, uh, the governor appoints you for a six-year term, and I was, I was serving on the board, which basically uh, there was discussion, uh, University of Texas primarily, about joining the Pac-10. Well, I, I really didn't think we had a lot in common with the Pac-10, and why travel two time zones? play a game. That didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. If we were going to change conferences, why not join the greatest conference in the country, uh, especially football-wise, and that's the Southeastern Conference. And we pursued the Southeastern Conference. They didn't pursue us. Uh, but later, uh, uh, they offered us an invitation. We, uh, we were admitted to the conference, and 
Some didn't know whether or not that was a good decision or not, but it turned out extremely well. A&M's made a pretty nice impact in, in one year in the league, and, and Johnny Manziel winning the Heisman Trophy. What do you think about that young quarterback? Well, I, uh, you know, uh, as, as we some of us wanted to tell the coach during spring practice, just leave him alone. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, he just makes things on his own. I mean, he's hard to tackle. He's got that great ability to escape trouble, and uh, he deserved the, the Heisman. Yeah. He, uh, uh, they lost two games, but they could have very easily beaten Florida and should have beaten LSU. And, of course, they did beat Alabama uh, in Tuscaloosa. Not many people do that. Alabama winning three out of the last four BCS national championships. What do you think of Nick Saban and the uh, job he's doing? What a great job. I was, uh, Nick played my golf tournament the other day, and I told him, I said, now, Nick, if you don't do it again, we're going to be hot now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not four out of five, right? Yeah, I mean, we're sort of used to this guy. What a great job he's done. I mean, he's a no-nonsense coach. He's an extremely good recruiter. Uh, they've got lots of depth. They're well coached. And I just can't imagine anybody doing a better job right now, college football, than what Coach Saban has done. Gene, all the years you, you coached, did you take things away from – from Bear Bryant, Tom Landry, a combination? Was it your own style? What was the style you had? Well, first of all, you've got to coach your own personality. Mm -hmm. There's no way I could have coached like Coach Landry. No way I could have coached like Coach Bryant. Uh, but I learned some things from both of them. You know, uh, Coach Bryant, probably the greatest college coach ever. I felt the same way about Coach Landry in professional football. Right. Uh, and there's some things that, that uh, they did that – I would incorporate some things they did I wouldn't. And uh, it's just a privilege, really, to work for those kind of people. I mean, can you imagine being in staff meetings uh, year after year with Coach Landry and, and being <laughs> on the field with, with Coach Bryant? I mean, it was a, my coaching career has been a joy. Well, it, it certainly rubbed off. Uh, 1992 National Championship with Alabama, a perfect 13-0 season, other than winning the title. What's the greatest memory you have, memory of that year, that well, season? Well, first of all, n no question about the joy that I got out of coaching. <clears throat> that was seeing a player graduate. You know, here, here would be a player, and a grandmother, a mother, say something like this. First one ever on either side of the family ever go to college. Help him with his books. And, you know, to see that player you know, graduate and get a degree, and it's it's life changing, obviously. Right, right. And, and you know, I know the importance of winning games, uh, you know, but but seeing those players be successful was a real joy I got out of coaching. Do you think we've gotten <clears throat> too far away from that? Yes, there are still the student athletes that want to graduate, they want to get that degree, but it's such a big business. Yeah, as you and, know. and you know what worries me really bothers me. It doesn't worry me, but nobody honors contracts anymore. Right. Universities, uh, you know, if a guy can have one or two bad years and he's gone. Uh, a head coach can have one or two good years and he's gone. Uh, somewhere along the line, I, I just feel like that both the coach and, and the schools, we, we need to honor contracts. Uh, you know, uh, we've got a law school. We, we teach people all over the world to honor contracts, and then, then we break them, either as a coach or a player, and, and that bothers me a little bit. Uh, it bothers me personally that we're making the season longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to decide who the game's for. If the game's for the player, then let's give the player a little consideration about how long the season is because whether we like it or whether we don't like it, you go to college for an education. You play football while you're there. In some areas, it gets like we're going to college to play football and we're going to try to get an education try while we're there. Try to squeeze it in, right. Yeah, and I just... Uh, uh, you know, that, I don't subscribe to that theory. I, uh, football's great. I love it. But it's it's not a life job for a lot of the players. Now, a few of them go into professional football, but most of them don't. I completely understand. We've had a crazy last couple of years, the turmoil of schools leaving leagues, joining other leagues. We also, though, have now in Division One A football, or we will in 2014, a four-team playoff. Do you like going in that direction? No. No, I, now if we're going to go to uh, it, it was coming. There's no question about that. What I, what I think is going to happen eventually is it's going to be like four major conferences, and there may be 20 teams in the conference, and then they'll have a championship game, and and then they're going to have some kind of playoff. Because as it is now, 
somebody still has to make the decision on who's going to be those top four. four. Right. And whoever's fifth is going to say, good night. Uh, we should have we should have been fourth. <laughs> and whoever's sixth is going to say, we beat third. And, you know, we beat the third team. And so it, you're still not going to satisfy everybody. Sure. Gene, what was it like to be one of the Junction boys? Well, you know, uh, it was it was hot. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, you know, you didn't get any water in those days. Uh, uh, the furthest thing from my mind was quitting. I, I never gave quitting a thought. I, you know, I was on scholarship. Uh, I was going to be able to get me a college degree. And, uh, now I was glad when Junction was over. But what ju made Junction so bad, really, was the lines were short. If you've got 15 ends, it takes a while before your time. Right. But if you just have six ends, your time comes up. For, I understand. Then if you just have four, it really comes up. For, and you still have the same two-hour practice session. And, uh, and we're in the middle of a drought. And every time you put your hands down, there's a big old goat heads or sand burrs. And, wow. And uh, it was the conditions. If Coach Bryant had known, and never did say this, but if he had known the conditions were that bad and and uh, I don't think we'd ever gone to Junction. What do you think Coach Bryant would do nowadays as we now live in an, in an era where if a coach hollers at uh, a kid, he gets in trouble. If he puts his hands on a kid, he gets in trouble. It's a lot different, as you know. How would Coach Bryant fair today? Just as successful? First of all, I, I think he would adjust some. Mm -hmm. I, I just, my wildest imagination, I, I can't imagine one of his football teams with a bunch of players with hair down the middle <laughs> of the back. Now, now it may happen. <laughs> and, and for him not to holler at them occasionally. Now, right. Now he didn't like for anybody to put their hands on him back when I was coaching for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard him tell some coaches, hey, keep your hands off the That was players. off limits. Yeah, just don't do that. If anybody's going to touch the player, it's going to be him. Uh, but, yeah, he, he would be a great coach under the, because he would recruit well. And, uh, you know, he wasn't opposed to changing. Yeah. You know, he had a, a couple of years that wasn't too good, and people in Alabama were a little upset with Up Coach Brown with a mm -hmm. six, 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 and whatever. And then they went to the wishbone. And uh, after that, they won some more national champions. So, uh, he had the ability to adjust, and that, that's one of the things you've got to do in college football and pro football. You're in the College Football Hall of Fame. What was that like? 2010, I think you were in Trine. Well, you know, it's it's a it really it's a compliment to the players and the coaches. You know, that's that's the bottom line. You you win football games, not because your scheme is mm -hmm. better than their scheme. You know, we're always talking about scheme. We, boy, that was a great call. Yeah, you win football games with football players making plays. Uh, if your football players don't make plays, uh, you have the greatest scheme in the world. But exactly. if they can't, and so if you, if you have good players making plays and win some games, well, obviously the coach has an opportunity to be in the Hall of Fame. So I know that a lot of coaches are better than I was, but I had some good players. What was your experience like in the NFL coaching the Cardinals and how much different was it from college? Well, very little for me. Uh, you know, if you'd have seen one of my pro teams practice or one of my college teams practice, you couldn't have told the difference really? very much, really. Uh, you know, times change now. They, they don't. In fact, they're talking about having a rule in Texas, and, and high school football in Texas is extremely big. I, I was reading an article the other day that said that they're talking about having no contact once the season gets underway. So all your drills will be hats and shoulder pads or just sort of going through it. And uh, now whether or not that passes or goes through, you know, I really don't know. But mm -hmm. now football is a contact sport. And, uh, you know, in order to get better week after week after week, well, somewhere along the line, you've got to have some tough drills. Huh? That's the reason I always felt like that, that my teams got better as the year went along because, you know, we still had good tough – you know you can't – they were physical. Be crazy, uh, mm -hmm. but just every once in a while, you got to have some contact if you're going to have some contact on Saturday. So, can I assume, with the changes they're making to the rules, that not, not only do you not like that, but maybe it's altered the game well, a bit? Well, first of all, when the headgear is used for protection, 
you know, you got a headgear and we're going to send you out to play. Well, th that's not a weapon. Right. You know, your headgear is not a weapon. You're not supposed to butt somebody or spare somebody. Mm -hmm. And so much of the time, that's where your injuries come from. Your headgear is for protection. But somewhere along the line, $50,000 fine to a guy that's making $5 million <laughs> is not all that big a deal. But now if he has to sit out the whole year, it may become a big deal. So uh, I think the rules in place, uh, we just have to en enforce uh, what the rules are. And if they say don't use your headgear as a weapon, somewhere along the line, that's got to be what it means. What's it like on the ranch? Well, it's uh, I enjoy it. I never have a day off. Uh, I raise cattle. And, uh, you know, you're constantly trying to get your pastures better. You, you're working your cattle. Uh, you've got some heifers that need something, uh, 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 some ground that needs to be fertilized. Right. Uh, you're doing something all the time. It's like a team, but they don't talk back to you. That's not a time. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, but, yeah, I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, when I was coaching at Texas A&M, <coughs> I bought some land. I didn't know come here from Sikkim about running a ranch, but I knew that when I retired, I didn't want to move on a golf course. I didn't want to just do nothing. I've been active. It took right. me 40 years to get it paid for. But now I've got it paid for, and I retired, and I had a place to go to live, and, and that was a good decision. Well, you, you look great. You sound great, Coach. It, it's been a pleasure having you on. I like to end all my interviews with something I call five for the road. So it's quick questions, first thing that comes to your mind. What's your favorite professional sports team in any sport? Well, uh, obviously, I, I used to like the Cowboys, uh, but not so much now. Mm. So, uh, you know, that's, I'd, I'd say probably the Rams. I, I like the father okay. of the Cardinals. How about your favorite pro athlete of all time, maybe growing up? Who was? Probably Raymond Berry. Oh, wow. Raymond Berry was something. Yeah, I'm yeah. a big Colts fan. Well, and Raymond and I went to high school together. One of the trivia questions in the NFL was what two head coaches Went to the same high school and had the same head coach, and it was Raymond. That's I. pretty good production. How about favorite music, uh, musician? What do you like to listen to? Well, I'm a country and western fan, and uh, uh, that's uh, I'm not much of a music man. I, I don't have to get in the car and turn the radio right, on. Right, right. I just, you but know. But a good country song now and, yeah. now, and now and again, right? And, and we lost a great one in George Jones yeah, just recently. Sure. Favorite movie? Of all time. Well, I love Patton. I thought that was, oh, a, was a great movie. That was a great movie. And uh, if I had to just pick one, I, I'm a John Wayne fan. I like all, <laughs> I'm not all surprised. of his, but you know, I, I'd say Patton probably. And finally, your, your favorite television show of all time, maybe. You something. know what I like to watch? What's that? Hey, you're going to laugh at this. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not silly, but uh, I, I enjoy watching that. And, of course, NCIS is, if I just go watch two, those would be the two. I, well, I watch Fox News most of the time. It, but it also reminds us of how smart these young kids are right. and how much we've forgotten that's over the years. Right. That's right. Coach, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Okay. We'll take a break. When we return, our overtime segment. <laughs> Athletes are always looking for that next hot training regimen to not only stay fit, but to keep their workouts fresh. Sit-ups and 5Ks will never hurt, but that type of workout can certainly become monotonous. CrossFit is something fresh, and it's not just for sculpted athletes, but for anyone looking to get in shape. Michelle Kinney is the owner of CrossFit Chickasaw, and she practices what she preaches. Next week, Michelle will participate in the CrossFit Games in California for a third time. She was a three-sport athlete at Mississippi State and a former standout at St. Benedict High School in Cordova. Recently, I spent some time with Michelle to find out more about her and the sport of CrossFit. Michelle, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. All right, give me the broad definition of CrossFit. All right, broad definition of CrossFit is constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity. What? I know, and it sounds like a you know Webster's Dictionary definition, but what we're looking for is um, just training this well-rounded version of fitness in a varied format. So we're not just focused on weights, we're not just focused on endurance, we're not just focused on body weight strength, we're focused on all of those things and creating a well-rounded athlete. How long has this been around? CrossFit Chickasaw or CrossFit in general? CrossFit in general. 
since 1999, 98, I think, is when those, those first people started doing CrossFit out in Santa Cruz, California. But CrossFit Chickasaw started May 18th, 2012. Yeah, everybody's looking for a way to make it more enjoyable, working out, staying in shape, not just the old jumping jacks and push-ups and sit-ups. Oh, definitely. And this seems to be a, a hot way to do that. Absolutely. It's in the constantly varied component kind of plays to that. So you're constantly engaged because it's always a different workout every time you step into the gym. So you don't get bored. You don't get bored mentally and you don't get bored physically. So physically you can plateau because you're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and when you change it up a bit, you're constantly seeing those gains and it's, it's very rewarding. How can you take the time out to do what you do and now you're getting ready for your third CrossFit Games, your yeah. third national competition, all the regional competitions you've been in while you're also running this place. This is yours, CrossFit Chickasaw, and I'm sure you're, you're, you're coaching a lot of people and helping them out. How do you find that time? Um, it's, I have a business partner that helps me run, run things, Robbie Froman, and then our coaching staff has done a tremendous job picking up those classes, helping me out as far as the, the gym day-to-day -day stuff goes because I'm training quite a bit, about four hours a day, six days a week. So wow. it's, it's, it's heavy loading. So just in those four training hours, that's, that's time devoted to training. But outside of that, I get tired and, um, you know, but my, my staff and my, my business partner helped me out a whole lot with that. Let's talk about next week in California, the CrossFit Games. You've had two under your belt. How do you learn from them? to make, make it a better result this time around? Well, the first time I was just totally starstruck. So it was just like, you know, a new kid, kid in a candy store type thing. Um, now I, I know going into it, a mindset that I'm, only, I'm as ready as I can be. So whatever they throw at me, we, know, we don't know what the events are, what, what they'll have us do. I just gonna do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability and just accept the outcome, however that may be, but you, basically full effort. You don't know what it's going to be right. I don't understand. You take the stage and then you say, do this and pretty much, it? pretty much. They, um, you know, we have three to four days of competitions. They won't let us know. They won't let us know how many events they'll usually tell us what an event is. Maybe the night before, or maybe two hours before we just have to be ready for any and everything. Three days of competition. You said it's officially three days of competition, but last year they surprised the athletes with a fourth day of competition. And so I'm, I'm just anticipating for this. They're time full around. of surprises. They, aren't they? are. What do you think your, your strongest area is and the one area you really need to work on? Strongest area is absolutely endurance. I have an endurance background, ran cross country in high school and in college. Um, so endurance is really strong suit of mine. Um, weightlifting is gonna be the other end of the spectrum. It's, it's my weakness. So I've been constantly training strength and trying to get that weakness a little bit better, but those are the two ends of the spectrum there. You, you mentioned high school. You've been an athlete all your life, St. Benedict High School and then mm -hmm. Mississippi State. Right three different sports at Mississippi State. What was that like juggling academics and athletics? Um, I, was, I was, I guess, really focused. Uh, Mississippi State does a great job with their, um, their student athletes to make sure that the, the academics are the focus, believe it or not. But um, yeah, it was just, it was a fun time and it just was easy. I mean, just playing ball and enjoying it, running and enjoying that, and then getting the work done on the side. Softball, cross country, track and field? Correct. What were your events in track and field? 3,000 meter steeplechase and javelin. What would you say to somebody out there who's watching you right now and they're like, wait a minute, I like what she's saying. I want to get involved. How do they get involved in CrossFit? Oh, they just got to send me an email or walk through our doors. I'll tell them all about it. I'll talk their ear off. But we start everybody off in our fundamentals program. So a lot of people are a little intimidated. Regardless of gender or background, we can help them out. So they just need to walk through our doors. We'll put them through a fundamentals program, really small group where we, we teach them the movements and get them ready for our big program. Well, with that said, with the fundamentals, Give me an idea. Talk about some of the actual things that they, they, we see ropes here, we see <laughs> rings here, a couple of specifics. Yeah, the fundamentals doesn't involve those scary things that, that catch your eye right when you walk in the door. Just the basic air squats movement one that we cover. And if you don't get the air squat down, we don't move on. We don't progress to the more complicated movements until we're certain that you're moving with that air squat well. Because if your squat's not good, we don't want to load it with a barbell and set you up for injury. So we're more about mechanics before we do volume or intensity. What is your goal for next week? Um, just literally give it my best um, and have fun because when the fun left CrossFit for a bit it 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 wasn't fun that sounds pretty obvious but I want to have fun and I want to do the best that I can out there and enjoy every minute of it because it's a very special place to be I missed out on it last year and I just want to soak it all up this year so I would imagine there are some that don't feel the same way you do that they're in it for the strict competition to win it all sure, sure. and maybe they don't enjoy it which they should 
Oh, no doubt. I mean, I'm a competitor. I want to win just like the best with the with the best of them. But like I said, we don't know what's coming, so I don't know what to expect. So I just know that I can only give all that I've got, and if I do that, I'll be victorious. In the final days leading up to it, will you train harder, more, or less? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think actually um, starting about a week out from the perceived date that we're going to start, I'm going to really start to taper and, and dial back my training. My volume is really high right now. I'm getting at least 12 training sessions in a week, so I need to have some energy come game time. <laughs> Absolutely. Michelle, enjoy yourself out there. Like you said, have fun. All Best right. of luck to you. Thanks, Greg. Great meeting you. Great meeting you. And best of luck to Michelle as we hope the third time for her will be the charm. And that will do it for this week's show. As always, you can see any of our previous shows by heading to our website, WKNO.org, and clicking on KNO Tonight. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.